great Israeli statesman Shimon Peres, when speaking of political solutions, uh, was fond of saying uh, that while one can make an omelette from an egg, one can't make an egg from an omelette. And what I think he was trying to say was that it's much easier to break something and create a mess than to fix it. And after years of brutal upheaval in the Middle East, I think most people agree uh, that this regional scrambled egg or regional omelette cannot be turned back into a box of eggs. So the question that we want to discuss with our panel today is, if these conflicts cannot be solved, and they cannot go on forever either, then what's next? One of the most influential and controversial books in Israel last year was a book called Catch 67 by Micha Goodman. And at the heart of Catch 67 is one provocative question. What if the conflict cannot be solved? What if there is no magic solution that both sides can agree on, implement, and see through? What if for Israel a full withdrawal from the West Bank would be every bit the same existential threat as remaining in control of those territories? What if that conflict cannot be solved? And for many policymakers and diplomats, it's uh, taken as an unspoken assumption, an axiom almost, that every conflict, every problem has a solution. But what if that's not the case? Catch 67 proposes a radical new paradigm. It says, instead of thinking about ending the conflict or managing the conflict, perhaps what Israelis need to start thinking about is trying to shrink the conflict instead. And shrinking the conflict means not pinning our hopes on a big comprehensive solution that will make the conflict go away once and for all. It means taking pragmatic actions, small steps that will begin the process of separation between Israelis and Palestinians, doing absolutely everything possible to minimize the occupation and its interference in Palestinians' lives without reducing Israeli security in parallel. And Goodman uses a medical analogy to try to explain what he means by shrinking the conflict. He says, some diseases like HIV AIDS are incurable, but they don't have to be fatal, because medical science can make incurable conditions non-lethal. It can make them chronic, something you can live with instead. And perhaps the, true, the same is true of political science. There might not be comprehensive solutions that can democratize Syria or stabilize Yemen or fulfill the Kurds' demands for self-determination. So perhaps diplomats and policymakers can instead explore creative accommodations that can help to shrink those conflicts, to minimize them, and make those realities more livable and more tolerable for everyone else instead. Peace and conflict in this thinking are not binary options. There is always a measure of peace in the world and a measure of conflict, and the challenge is to try to maximize the peace and to minimize the conflict. So in this panel, we want to try to brainstorm some of those questions. Can the conflict in the Middle East be solved, or can they only be shrunk? What realistic options are there to try to shrink those conflicts, especially in the context of the era of Donald Trump and the fraying liberal Western order? And what does it mean to start planning for a, for a future in which we accept that those conflicts are probably going to survive and persist, but will have been transformed into chronic conditions instead. Now, I recently heard that President Trump is going to present his uh, peace plan. I am not familiar with the details of this peace plan. I'm not sure that I know what it is. I have no idea what they have uh, elaborated uh, uh, in Washington, but I'm very, very happy that the president is prepared to connect his name to a peace plan. He could have said that this is a peace plan of the State Department. He could have said that this is a peace plan of uh, Jason Greenblatt, the uh, special emissary. No. It is called by the United States the Trump plan for peace in the Middle East, which means that the president is prepared to link his own name to a peace plan. Now, why is it important? I'm, I don't know Trump, I have to admit. I may have met him, I don't know, years back, but I don't know him. But there is one thing evident about him which no one can miss. If there is one thing which he hates, or rather one thing which he is absolutely in love with, is that he will not be linked with any failure. 
if he is prepared to have his name on a peace plan called the Trump peace plan, then it shows that maybe he has some confidence that it has a chance. Now, I can't believe that such a plan will not be based on the two-state solution. There can be no solution if it's not a two-state solution. So there is a chance that there are at least two people in the world which believe that peace is possible. One is President Trump, who is prepared to link his name to a peace plan. And humbly, if I may say, the other one is myself. question that the mood in the United States is very much not to get involved. We bur we, we, we've been burned in Iraq, particularly um, the, the, I think the, uh, most every poll now indicates the majority of Americans believe the Iraq war was not either justified or carried out correctly or um, has failed to deliver what we wanted. And that's led to a dramatic mood change in the United States. They throw in Afghanistan, our longest war, and there's a real reticence. Um, there's a lot of angry rhetoric about another war, this one with Iran. I think the administration would much rather see some kind of action by protesters inside Iran to do the dirty work for them. I think that's unrealistic. I think that there's a lot of talk. The conventional wisdom in Washington is that Iran is on the cusp. I don't think they're there yet. Um, I think it's wishful thinking. Uh, and so the, it gets down to what can the U.S. do to whether it's uh, help create democratic change and turmoil in Libya, Yemen, uh, you know, contain autocratic leaders uh, in Egypt, and and particularly at a time when the U.S. is reducing its foreign aid, and aid was always a source of soft power, and something that we could say, look, we will help you, whether it's with job creation or democracy, pro democracy promotion, creating civil society, that, were, that we had um, the tools, uh, and with the change in the public opinion about how much we want to get involved in any part of the world, but particularly the Middle East, with a reduction in aid, with this period of, of withdrawal, um, the United States just doesn't want, the American public just doesn't want to get engaged. And so that limits us a great deal. The Russians have been very creative. Uh, um, very manipulative in some ways in terms of understanding how to work the Americans, how, what the Americans would tolerate or not at least stand up to prevent, has given, I think, the Russians uh, uh, an edge in some places, but de facto, because the U.S. hasn't done that much. Um, and I think that's going to be the reality for some time to come. I think the U.S. wants to try multilateralism, try as it's doing with Syria to create alternatives. I think that's very unrealistic. It's too late in the day. I think the United States, the, United, the Europeans and the Sunni Arab states are going to have very little influence for the foreseeable future on Syria. That as far as the Israeli-Palestinian conflict we don't need the Russians and we don't need the Americans. And if we don't, we don't need them. I dealt with it and I negotiated with them and I achieved more when I didn't have the Americans telling me what to do and the Russians advising me what to do because nothing that the two sides will not agree with will never happen. And the, the myth that it depends on the superpowers or if we talk about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, even about the greater Arab powers to influence, moderate Arab powers to influence, for instance, the Palestinians, it's a misconception, it's a mistake. And you can take an example from what happened in the second Camp David in 2000 when the President of the United States of America begged Yasser Arafat, begged him, 
used every power of persuasion that he possessed, promised him the Garden of Eden, threatened him of depriving him of everything, asking him to agree to uh, uh, conclude an agreement with uh, Barak. And Yas Arafat said no, and nothing happened to him. The power of the, the power of persuasion of the superpowers is much more limited than most of us uh, want to believe. However, I said, and I am optimistic, that an agreement can be achieved. It can be achieved if the two sides will come to the inevitable conclusion that it serves their long-range interests. I think that uh, a greater number of Israelis that believe so, that uh, an agreement on the basis of what I proposed uh, is not only is achievable and is uh, acceptable, but is uh, beneficial to the long-range interest of Israel. I think that the Palestinians now recognize it just as well. But uh, the leaderships of the two uh, nations, as I said before, are reluctant to take the risk. And there can be no peace and no progress and no solution without a courageous leadership that is prepared to risk their position for the sake of achieving a greater goal for their people. I think it's quite clear that America has ceased to play a dominant role in the Middle East as it used to be in the past, and it's fading out. And into this vacuum, uh, uh, very skillfully, uh, the Russian president, who is a very skillful and very able and a very determined person, to the extent that I can judge him from a personal uh, relationships, I think he is penetrating into a much more influential position. So I don't think that he is so much interested in trade-offs. I don't think that Donald Trump, strangely enough, is interested in trade-offs because he has a very straightforward position of pulling out and, and maybe in, in line with the historical position uh, of separation that characterized American foreign policy in the 20th uh, of the 20th century in, uh, after the Second, First World War. And, and therefore, I don't quite see an option for trade-offs that can be helpful and useful for solving some of the issues uh, that are now uh, bothering uh, the uh, Middle East. Mr. Trump is sending all kinds of crisscross signals about the Middle East. On the one hand, the talk about Iran pulling out of J JCPOA, um, bad-mouthing the Iranian leadership sounds very strong. And next day you read that the carrier battle group is steaming out of the Persian Gulf in the face of Iranian threat to close the Strait of Ormuz to oil exports, uh, pulling out the Patriot batteries. What is that about? I'll tell you what is that about. The real concern in the United States today, as the current director of the CIA just announced recently, talking about CIA priorities, is no longer terrorism. It's nation states. Translate. China and Russia. In that order. It's not Russia and China, it's China and Russia. The carrier battle group is needed in the Pacific, and the Patriot missiles either in Europe or in the Pacific, not in the Persian Gulf. What is the message to the Iranians? And I think we had a senior general, I don't remember if it was a CENTCOM commander. Robin, did you see that? A senior general yesterday saying the goal of the United States is not regime change in Iran. I'm not happy with some of the steps taken by Russia and by 
President Putin, certainly not the introduction of the S-300 uh, to Syria uh, uh, as of uh, the last few days. I discussed this issue with President uh, Putin many times in the past, and I think that I even uh, that's at least what he told others, that I convinced him not to provide uh, the S-300 neither to Syria nor to Iran, which he didn't until uh, recently to Iran and now to, uh, to Syria. But I still think that even though I don't like some of the steps, and even though I think that uh, uh, Putin has certainly decided to uh, exercise the opportunity provided to him by the absence of a um, serious American presence in the Middle East in order to increase his influence and his presence in certain areas in a much more significant manner than it used to be, I think that he knows the limits and that he will not cross limits which might put the entire Middle East into a turbulence which may destabilize uh, the situation in a very dangerous manner. So I don't like some of the steps of Russia. I'm, I'm not happy with certain measures taken by the Russians. I think that they should have prevented Iran from uh, positioning their military units in Syria on the first place. But I do think, based on my acquaintance with Putin, that he has defined the borders and the limits, and that he will, within these limits, he will try to maximize the benefits for Russia without risking uh, total destabilization. There is only one possible solution, and this is a two-state solution. There can be no other, and against all the uh, analysis and uh, expert opinions that I keep hearing all the time, I personally believe that this solution is not only the only possible solution, this solution is achievable, is doable, and can be implemented within a rel relatively short period of time by what it requires first and foremost is a determined leadership on both sides, which is the Israeli and the Palestinian, that will have a firm commitment to move forward towards such a solution. Is this the case right now? I'm not certain. And I don't want to share now the blame between the sides. But to the best of my understanding, knowledge, and conviction, this is the only possible solution, and it is both doable and achievable within a short period of time if the leaderships of the two sides will have the courage, the determination, and the commitment to move forward against, perhaps, the initial expectations of some of their constituents, but in the best interests of the long-range uh, needs of both nations. I talked at length with uh, Abu Mazen, Mahmoud Abbas, the president of the Palestinian Authority. We agreed that nine years ago, when we were negotiating, we were that close to conclude a deal it didn't work out. We may have needed another three, four months, as he said, for me to be in the prime ministership in order to conclude this deal. But we were very close to it. And what is important is that I could understand from what President Abbas said to me and further said publicly to television is that the framework which was proposed by me on behalf of the State of Israel to the Palestinians has never been rejected by him, which means that it still can be the basis and perhaps the only basis for an agreement 
between Israel and the Palestinians. And finally, I want to say this. As I said before, there is no other solution. There is only one solution. Not many, not variations. Only one solution, a two-state solution. And this is urgent because it can be the basis of a comprehensive, dramatic, maybe historic change in the Middle East and perhaps far more than just the Middle East. An agreement between Israel and the Palestinians is a key to stabilize the Middle East, to change the parameters of the present situation completely, to create a partnership, open, official, public, economic, military, effective partnership between all the moderate countries in the Middle East. And Israel is at the center with the Saudis, with the Egyptians, with Jordan, with the Emirates, with Bahrain, with Kuwait, with all these others, moderate Arab countries. And it can create a momentum that will influence the politics of the world at large. Multilateralism is at work in Syria. The problem is you have rival multilateralisms. You have Turkey, Russia, and Iran, and the Astana process trying to figure out how to solve or come up with a formula to end the Syrian civil war and ensure that President Assad stays in power. And you have the United States, the Europeans, and some Mideast countries a rival process that was announced in a more formal way last week during the opening of the UN General Assembly. And the problem is getting these two multinational pro multilateral processes to coordinate and come up with uh, common principles. Until the international community does, the danger is that the Syrian civil war doesn't really end. Uh, the reality is that President Assad probably is more vulnerable in peacetime than he is even in war. And the twilight zone in between, uh, retaking huge chunks of the territory and actually restoring Syrian sovereignty is huge. And that's why multilateralism will be so important in resolving this conflict. Um, the dangers to Assad, and this is where the international community will have to play a big role, is that he, he, and he will assume, reassume control of a country for, with $400 billion of destruction, where the political flashpoints that triggered the Arab Spring haven't been resolved, where the majority of the population still feels marginalized. The international community can only have so much influence, but it will take their agreement to fully come up with a solution to solve Syria, or the danger is that Syria is even more unstable for another decade, and that Syria isn't even to hold together as a state as we've assumed it uh, in its current borders. The danger also, particularly to Israel, is that Syria has become the proxy battleground uh, in, its, in its rivalry for influence in the region or for stability in the region with Iran. Israel, I think, is engaged in over 200 airstrikes uh, on Syrian territory. Iran is now uh, primarily on Iranian targets. Iran is now uh, deploying missiles, trying to replicate its buildup of Hezbollah in Lebanon now in Syria, and that widens the vulnerability of Israel. The way multilateralism can work is if it is beneficial and if it is inclusive, because a speaker in the plenary session said that multilateralism was a Western idea. 
So are we now still going after multilateralism as a Western idea or multilateralism as an inclusive idea which brings all the countries of the world in it? It, is, it has to be inclusive, therefore, and it has to be beneficial. And Syria is an outstanding example and a current example for the last eight years of why multilateralism is negative and disruptive because four of the five members, permanent members of the Security Council are involved not only in terms of their objective but on the ground in Syria. And that is why you find that there is no agreement whatsoever on the Security Council, in the Security Council on bringing peace to that country. Neither has there been any kind of a UN resolution allowing them to do it. GCUAP also is, a, is an example of dialogue. And I think uh, it is an example of multilateralism. Just, just, just now and just in the time that we are. Iran sees uh, this agreement as a multilateral agreement, as, uh, as an agreement that uh, was chained by the works and the best tries and, uh, of uh, a few countries, and they came together to such a result. Uh, this is a part of uh, UN, this is a law that was approved by the Security Council, this is a part of international law. Uh, I think if it's possible to deny GCOP, if possible to deny international law, if it's possible to deny uh, Security Council, it's possible to deny multilateralism and it's possible to deny dialogue also. This is a basement for GCAP. This is international law. This is dialogue. This is agreement that was uh, obtained. And if we set it aside, on which basement can we achieve uh, an agreement? And uh, I think if the agreement, uh, if GCAP is denied, it means every agreement is based on precedence. And we know that presidents are not permanent. This is law that is permanent. So, so really, I want to say that uh, in this time, this is an example of uh, uh, dialogue. This is a symbol of multilateralism. And uh, because of that, it's supported by you, the uh, uh, most of the countries and because uh, it's, it is in the benefit of peace and in the benefit of international law. The interesting thing is that multilateralism is still at play in dealing with the Iran nuclear issue and the wider array of problems. Uh, one of the things that was so striking about the UN this year was the language from both President Trump and President Rouhani that for all the anger that has been expressed publicly by both men, Trump actually tweeted the morning uh, uh, of his session chairing the UN General, the um, Security Council, that he wasn't going to meet Rouhani this time, maybe in the future. And then he said, he's probably an absolutely lovely guy absolutely lovely guy. I mean, the Iranians were in shock. Um, the Iranians uh, also were very open to talking to the United States. And President Rouhani said he didn't think there was any problem that couldn't be resolved through dialogue. And Zarif described dealing with the United States with the movie 50 First Dates which is the Adam Sandler movie where the, uh, he's dating a woman who has amnesia and every day 
he has a date with her and it's, they start from scratch. He said, this is what it's like. Uh, but he also said that, the, that Iran was still willing to talk. Now, needless to say, they have vastly different agendas. But the principle established through multilateral negotiations through the JCPOA is still alive. Maybe barely, but it's still alive. Today, we're facing more and more international challenges, and I think uh, the main reason for that uh, is uh, the attempt by the United States and its allies uh, to maintain their dominance at the expense of the rest of the international community. The practice of meddling in the internal affairs of other countries and the use of force without the authorization by the UN Security Council, um, um, application of economic and political sanctions, uh, and the attempt uh, to to adapt uh, to modern realities, uh, the Cold War institutions, leads uh, to um, uh, abating our trust uh, and worsens international relations. It is to the detriment of international security and stability. It also raises the risk uh, of uh, military conflicts. Uh, the US, uh, in particular, uh, withdrew from JCPOA. Uh, it is uh, trying to undermine, uh, undermine the fundamental principles of the Middle East uh, settlement um, and to use uh, US laws um, um, uh, beyond the territory of the uh, United Nations. The US uh, um, is unleashing a new trade war and using the language of ultimatums, even with regard to US or close allies. The US is advancing a unipolar uh, model of the world, uh, but this model is doomed to failure. When you're working in the media, you see how much the media are important, especially in the way you are covering uh, certain regions in the world. And it's very interesting to see in the talk show, coming every day, every evening, specialists, analysts, coming to explain that all the time the world has changed. They are all the time saying, yes, but the world has changed. But they are not saying that the world is still changing, and at the moment they are speaking, it's still moving. And when we are talking about the Middle East, it's very important to understand that things have changed, but things are changing a lot. Elon, you said a few minutes ago that every problem has a solution, so my recommendation is to start to see the Middle East no more as a problem, but as a solution. And for that, we need to have the global picture and to understand the global picture. If you want to understand the complexity of the Middle East, you need to offer the global picture. And when you have the global picture, it's very interesting to see that there is a difference of perception. If you are outside the Middle East, you have one perception. Everything is stuck. If you are living inside the Middle East, you have another perception. And I think today, as said uh, Mr. Prime Minister Olmert, we are at a crossroad. It could be an opportunity to make peace. Things are changing. The countries in the Middle East are watching each other in a different way because they have common interest. They have common interest in the way to manage Iran. They have common interest in the way to manage Syria. They have common interest in the way to manage Yemen. And I really think, as a former diplomat, especially French, you heard this morning Dominique de Villepin, who was my teacher, I don't believe in a bilateral peace plan because they don't have any interest, Israeli or Palestinian, to do a deal together alone. The Israelis want the status quo, and the Palestinians, they are existing through the fight and the battle against the Israelis. I don't believe also in a big international plan, because as I said, there is a huge gap of perception, especially in Europe, about what's going on in the Middle East and the way of the countries in the Middle East are feeling every day. But I do really think that a regional plan could happen today. And I hope so. And uh, 
you know, when I came to Israel to build this amazing project of I-24 News, all the journalists ask me, what is your keyword? My keyword is coexistence. And if today you want to move in the Middle East, you need to move in coexistence. I remember the, the newspaper, Yediot Acharonot, who is a very famous one. I gave my first interview, and I explained I wanted to build an international network with Israelis and Palestinians working together and delivering the news everywhere in the world. The headline was the most craziest guy with the most craziest project. I'm happy that five years after, I'm here in front of you as the CEO of I-24 News, and I'm proud to tell you that we have a unique newsroom with 400 people in Tel Aviv, where you have Jewish people, Muslim, Druze, Christian, I think we can find some agnostic also, not only working together every day, but producing together the same content. That means we are able to build something together. That means coexistence is possible. And if today we have that perception that nothing is possible and everything is stuck, it's because I think the presentation that the media are doing in the world. I think the factors that triggered the Arab Spring can be celebrated, the fact that you have the majority of the population in the region is now educated, and that includes its girls. The fact that there is that because of that education, that people have a greater sense of the world, the change in the world, uh, the the rights of the individual, and that because of technology, they have an ability to circumvent state control. 20 years ago, Al Jazeera was founded. It was the first independent satellite station that could circumvent state control. Today, there are over 500 independent satellite television stations in the Middle East. It just shows you the, that there is no longer one truth, one idea. The problem, of course, is that the kids who were behind the Arab Spring didn't have the resources, the maturity, the experience, the political parties, or an idea about what they could create as an alternative. So we've seen the beginning of a process that, um, that the international community initially supported, didn't know how to offer direction as well, but will play a role as this young generation grows into the political space and because they are the majority, will increasingly shape the future of these countries. I think there's hope down the road, um, so I don't think we have to totally despair of the world's most volatile region.